Good morning, everybody. I think we'll do that again next time. We'll turn the lights off <laughs> right before we start. It gets the meeting ready to go. Uh, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, a lot of people in here will be a little bit uh, sleepy-eyed this morning. We had a great event last night, the University Award Dinner for Tom Ross, and I left a little after midnight, and Tom was out back smoking cigars as I left. So. <laughs> It was, uh, it, it, it was a great event, and I want to thank everybody who was there and everybody who had a part in it. Uh, I would like to remind uh, everyone to turn their cell phones off, and at this time I'd ask Bill Webb to give the invocation. One of the things I like best about our board is we begin our meetings with an invocation. At the last meeting, my good friend Joe Knott treated us to a lecture. I'm not nearly as eloquent as he, so I would just invite everyone who would like to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our stay, our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bill. Wonderful. Uh, Secretary Perry, will you please call the roll? Chairman Bissett. Here. Vice Chairman Aiken. Here. Ms. Burris Floyd. Ms. Burris Floyd. Mr. Byers. Mr. Byers. Mr. Davenport. Here. Ms. Finnegan. Here. Mrs. Gage. Here. Mr. Goolsby. Here. Mr. Granger. Here. Mr. Hinton. Here. Mr. Holmes. Here. Mr. Hood. Here. Mr. Knott. Here. Mr. Cotis. Here. Mr. Lampy. Mr. Lampy. Mr. Long. Here. Mrs. McNeil. Here. Ms. Maxwell. Here. Mr. Alex Mitchell. Here. Mr. Champ Mitchell. Mr. Champ Mitchell. Mrs. Nelson. Here. Mr. Parrish. Mr. Parrish. Mr. Pickett. Here. Mr. Powers. Here. Mr. Rippey. Here. Mr. Sloan. Mr. Sloan. Mr. Smith. Here. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Siwasink. Mr. Siwasink. Mr. Webb. Here. Ms. Wiley. Here. Mr. Williford. Here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. The State Ethics Act took effect on January 1, 2007, and all the voting members of the Board of Governors are covered by the Act. Under the Act, you have a duty to avoid conflicts of interest and appearances of conflicts. Looking at the agenda for today's meeting, does anyone know that you have a conflict of interest or, or an interest that would give rise to the appearance of a conflict of interest? If so, uh, let me know now. Mr. Chairman, uh, under yes. consent, items A and B. Okay, thank you, Mr. Aiken. Anyone else? As we begin the business portion of our meeting, I would like again to remind everyone of the board's expectations for conduct at our meetings. We ask that attending today, that those attending today remain respectful of fellow attendees and the board. Those attending on official, uh, those attending an official meeting may not engage in conduct that interferes with the rights of others to observe and listen to the proceedings. Any individual who disrupts the meeting will be asked to leave and may be subject to arrest, but I'm sure we're not gonna have that today, so looking forward to a great meeting. Before we have the administration of the oath of office for our uh, new governor, I believe Zach King, the outgoing president of the Association of Student Governments, has a few words he would like to say. Zach? Well, thank you all. Um, 
I hope I get through this without getting uh, too emotional. Um, when I was first elected by the student body to serve on this board, I had a million perceptions as to how it functioned, why it existed, and wondered who in the world are these strangers who govern our university. But standing in front of you one year later, I think I found the answers to these questions. I've learned the board is not comprised of strangers at all. It's much more like a family. Not a conventional family, but like most families, we've agreed, disagreed, and yes, have even had the occasional food fight. Uh, but at the end of the day, and at the end of each disagreement, we've been able to come together and put the obligation we have to our university and to our students above ourselves and our own personal politics. So the people, uh, the people around this table uh, rather care uh, deeply about education, and they make a whopping zero dollars an hour doing so. Um, I've never had a call, an email, or a meeting request ignored by this board. And I've always been able to discuss concerns and walk away knowing, even if we aren't on the same page, that the student voice has been heard and has been respected. While it's something I worried about, you know, being the first GLBT member, know that I have never, for one minute, felt judged, uncomfortable, or discouraged from speaking with anything but a full and open mind. I've never felt like an outlier, besides my age, of course. Um, <laughs> oh, she had to say that. I had to say that. <laughs> Keeps me from getting emotional. Um, and uh, the next point, I've said this repeatedly across our system through the past year, um, but the deteriorating mental health and wellness of our students, in my opinion, is the single toughest issue and most important issue we face today. I don't need to list all the stats, you all have Google, uh, but behind the exponentially growing rate of students with mental illnesses, you know, you'll see that in those numbers. Um, but mental illness isn't just in our heads. Um, students don't need to simply toughen up or put their mind over matter. When a fourth of all students have been diagnosed or treated for a mental illness in the past year, we don't have just a problem. We have a mental health epidemic. And I know that this board knows this. Students have debt, a huge pressure to succeed. We are underslept, undernourished, and are too quick to pop a pill instead of taking that 40-minute jog. Change is hard, especially on this issue. It's a group effort, and it will take years of dedication to move this needle just an inch. Over this last year, while I may have lost two inches off my hairline, um, I'm not kidding, my hairdresser blames you guys. Uh, <laughs> but what I have not lost um, is my confidence in this university, in this board, and in our leadership. I want to end with a short anecdote uh, about President Spellings that I believe is a small uh, example that illustrates um, the fortune we have to have you at the helm of our university. In those first few days after being elected, uh, President Spellings called and we had an extensive conversations about issues, concerns, and life in general. And on that call, I'll never forget this line. She said, Zach, I don't just want to be your colleague, I want to be your friend. And you've become one. This showed me the true heart, humility, and graciousness behind our fearless leader. And if any of you have ever experienced her handshake, then wow, you'll know she's legit. <laughs> it's impressive. <laughs> I don't even have moves like that, Madam President. Um, but I really believe that you have the ability to become one of the great leaders of this fine university. And I know you will guide edu uh, higher education into a whole new frontier. Everyone won't always be happy, but I can promise your skeptics will be far surprised by your successes and the student leaders especially will always give you a fair shot and a fair shake and will never judge you except through your actions. So today, I leave with love and hope. My time serving students here has been the true highlight of my life.
and I've, gr I've grown tremendously because of it. I couldn't have had such a successful term without my incredible advisor, Bethany Megan. She's been incredible. My cabinet at ASG, my chief of staff, Madeline Finnegan, my successor, um, and our wonderful UNC System student body presidents and every single one of the people you see in this room. And more than anyone, I owe it all to my family. May God bless this great state and look over our beautiful university. Thank you all so much for giving me the privilege of public service. Thank you, Zach. Uh, I, I know I speak for the entire board when I'd say what a great pleasure it has been working with you past year, and I know we're going to be reading uh, great things about you in the future. So good luck to you and keep up the good work. It is a pleasure, is my pleasure at this time to welcome Madeline Finnegan to the Board of Governors. Madeline recently was elected to serve as president of the UNC Association of Student Governments, and in that capacity, she will be the ex officio member of the Board of Governors. Madeline is a student at North Carolina State University and is a Park Scholar. We are delighted that there are a number of special guests here today for Madeline, and they are her parents, Carla and Stephen Finnegan, who I believe are back here and uh, her grandfather, Thomas Finnegan, uh, and her friend, Mr. Thomas Pulliam. Administering the oath of office today will be the Honorable Justice Robert Edmonds. Justice Edmonds is a graduate of the UNC Chapel Hill School of Law. From 1978 to 1982, he served as Assistant District Attorney in the 18th Judicial District in Guilford County. From 1982 to 1986, he was an assistant U.S. attorney for the Middle District of North Carolina. In 1986, President Reagan appointed him U.S. attorney for the Middle District of North Carolina. He continued in that position through the administration of President Bush in 1989, serving until 1993. From 1993 to 1998, he worked as a lawyer in private practice handling state and federal criminal defense work. And in 2001, Justice Edmonds was elected Associate Justice on the North Carolina Supreme Court, where he continues to serve. Justice Edmonds, thank you for being here this morning. Will you please step forward to administer the oath of office? Madeline, will you and your mother and father and your grandfather uh, please join us? You can't do it wrong. <laughs> Crank around a little bit so you're looking towards me. Uh, and also the camera. Try to <laughs> can do both of those. Place your left hand on the Bible. Third in a row. And do you, Madeline Finnegan, solemnly swear that you will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States? In Constitution and laws of North Carolina not inconsistent therewith, and that you will faithfully discharge the duties of your office as a member of the Board of Governors of the University of North Carolina. And further, do you solemnly and sincerely swear that you will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the state of North Carolina and to the constitutional powers and authorities which are or may be established for the government thereof, and that you will endeavor to support, maintain, and defend the Constitution of said state, not inconsistent with the Constitution of the United States, to the best of your knowledge and ability, so help you God. I do. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.
can have at least 30 minutes for a little speech. Sure. Hang on. I'll sign right here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so now you've seen me do a big life step. So uh, thank you. It's nice to meet all of you. Um, thank you for such a warm welcome this morning. I'm incredibly honored to be here joining you today as we make important decisions for the students of the UNC system. Uh, I'm also especially honored and humbled to have been elected to represent the student voice on the board. Uh, even though it's ex officio, it's really important and critical that we have student representation here. And while I can't represent every single student of the system, I can you know, give you bits and pieces of what I have as experience as a student and what the people I've met have experienced being part of the UNC system. Um, I've attended public school all my life. And I started uh, at NCSSM four years ago. So I started as a junior in high school at the School of Science and Math. So I'm really close with Chancellor Roberts. I don't know if he's here today, but he's fantastic. Um, so for the first time when I, when I started at the School of Science and Math, I was surrounded by people about everything, as my parents can attest to. <laughs> um, on our campuses and as a member of the Board of Governors this year, I hope to fight to strengthen and preserve all of the things that made me want to be a part of and contribute to the UNC system. This year, those focuses will probably be mental health, diversity, and voter mobilization. Uh, we're continuing to work, uh, the, we're continuing the work of Zach and his team from last year on targeting ways that we can improve access to mental health services and decrease the stigma of getting help, which is incredibly important. Uh, it's also especially important to focus on the burden that's caused by rising tuition and student loan debts in our system, and I think that it's important we keep it in mind as we make decisions. The UNC Association of Student Governments and I also want to focus on diversity in our system. Uh, with regards to HB2, we will work to ensure the safety, comfort, and equality for our LGBTQIA students. We also plan to advocate for the needs of our historically minority serving institutions um, and their students. In the face of concerns for reduced funding, enrollment, and graduation rates at these institutions, we hope to address root causes of disparity uh, and uh, sorry, and work to preserve the diversity and heritage of these institutions. Lastly, in this ever contentious election year, uh, we want to focus on making the student voice heard on local, state, and national levels through civic duty. We're working to help establish and maintain on-campus early voting sites, and we'll be working with campuses to strategically register, educate, and mobilize students to the polls this year. These are the people that make up the future of North Carolina. So once again, I'm honored to be serving as the student voice this year. I know it'll be an incredibly important year for the board. And in difficult but very exciting times like these, I'm thankful to have the guidance of my parents, Stephen and Carla, my grandfather, Thomas, um, my fantastic advisor, Bethany, and all of the friends that came to see me here today. Um, I'm also incredibly thankful to Zach King, President Spellings, members of the board, Chancellor Roberts and Chancellor Woodson, and Ann Lemon for your warm welcome. I'm looking forward to working with all of you for a better North Carolina. Thank you. I want to make a few remarks about our precious friend, Zach King and Madeline. Uh, we are enjoying calling each other Madam President. <laughs> Congratulations. I really look forward to working with you. Uh, I'm excited about the beginning of your term, and as your swearing in draws to a close, uh, the term of a caring and compassionate leader whom I've enjoyed getting to know, as you all have, since, since accepting this role in October, and that is ASG President Zach King. From our first conversation, which Zach mentioned a little bit about, Zach demonstrated his commitment to representing the needs of all of the system's students. 
He firmly communicated the expectations and concerns of students, but did so in a way that was kind and welcoming. I finished that conversation with a new ally and a sense of the aspirations students have for this university. I'm sure I'm not alone in this experience. Zach has almost certainly helped each of you better understand the needs of students and has done so in a warm, empathy-driven approach that inspired us all. His unique leadership style has without question <coughs> paid off. The Association of Student Governments has greatly expanded its advocacy efforts in regard to mental health awareness and voter education. In fact, students were instrumental in helping pass the Connect NC bond in March, and they are already working to secure on-campus voting sites across the state for this fall's election. Zach is also a fierce advocate for the LGBTQ community, bringing to us the unique concerns of an important group of students. It is through a tremendous amount of work that Zach is able to accomplish so much. Somehow, he strikes the balance between his commitments as ASG president, his service on the Board of Governors, and managed to graduate. <laughs> he even finds time to care for his beloved dog, Winston. <laughs> Never was there a clearer picture of just how busy he was than last month when he left New York, where he had been participating in a meeting of the United Nations Security Council at 4 a.m. to join us here at a board meeting at 9. Zach, thank you for sharing with me and with this board the stories of talented, hardworking, and intelligent students that define this university. We all wish you the best of luck as you enter the post-college world, but given your professionalism, your drive, your intellect, and your compassion, we don't think you'll really need luck. While we will miss having you with us, I'm certain that your impact on this board and the insights that you have shared will continue to guide us for many years. We are all pleased to call you colleague and friend. Please join me again in thanking Zach. Thank you, President Spellings. And once again, congratulations to both Zach and Madeline. Uh, I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes for the open session of the meeting of Friday April 25th, uh, 2016. Move. Have a second? Second. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes for the open session of the meeting of Wednesday, April 27th, 2016. Have a motion? Move. Good. We have a motion and a second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign, the motion carries. I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes for the open session of the meeting of Tuesday, May, May 10th, 2016. So moved. Second. A motion to second. Any discussion? All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign, the motion carries. We now come to one of the highlights of our annual calendar. Annually, the Board of Governors has the honor of selecting recipients for the Oliver Max Gardner Award. Established by the will of the late Governor Gardner, this award recognizes a University of North Carolina faculty member, <laughs> faculty member's contributions to the welfare of the human race. This is the 68th year in the history of the award. We are especially delighted and honored that the Gardner family is represented here today. I would like everyone to welcome Mrs. Sarah Gardner Naftolin, who is the great granddaughter of Governor Gardner, along with her husband, Josh. Could you all please stand? Thank you very much for being with us here today. We are most grateful to the Gardner family and the Gardner Foundation for the continuing support in recognizing the vital importance of faculty in our university. I want to begin by thanking the members of this year's Oliver Max Gardner Award Committee for their hard work, their steady commitment, 
and the extra meetings that were necessary in preparation for today's awards presentations. As you know, this is not an easy task, selecting from the thousands of wonderful faculty members that we have throughout our system. So at this time, I would like to recognize Roger Aiken, Vice Chairman of the Board, who served as Chairman of this year's committee on the OMAX Gardner Award. Roger. Thank you, Chairman Bissett, and good morning. On behalf of the Board of Governors and this year's committee, consisting of Governors Pearl Burris Floyd, Alex Mitchell, Mike Williford, and myself, it is a privilege to introduce the recipient of the 2016 Oliver Max Gardner Award. After careful consideration of many qualified nominees, the committee chose two recipients for this year's honor. The first recipient is Dr. David Allen Shapiro, the Robert Lee Madison Distinguished Professor of Communication Sciences and Disorders at Western Carolina University. We are very pleased that several of Dr. Shapiro's relatives, friends, and distinguished colleagues are with us today. You honor us with your presence. Please stand to be recognized as I call your name. Mrs. Kay Shapiro, Dr. Shapiro's wife of 32 years. Their daughter, Sarah, a 2007 graduate of UNC Chapel Hill. Their son, Aaron, a 2010 graduate of North Carolina State University. I bet they have fun during, during ball games. <laughs> Dr. Shapiro's sister-in-law, Ms. Kimberly Doherty, and her husband, Dave Doherty. Mrs. Barbara Clark, a close friend of the Shapiro family, and by the way, also a University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill alumni. Mrs. Sandra Ulrich, a former colleague. Dr. Mary Sue Pickering, a former colleague and mentor. Dr. Gurney Chambers and his wife, Ann Chambers. Dr. Chambers is the former Dean of Western Carolina University's College of Education and Psychology. And the wonderful staff members from Western Carolina, would you please stand to be recognized? <laughs> and I want to recognize, of course, the great champion for and leader of Western Carolina University, Chancellor David Belcher. You have We are very glad that each of you could be with us on this special day. Imagine being unable to communicate. People with speech and language disorders are challenged on a daily basis to be heard, whether by their families, their workplace colleagues, or anyone else they encounter on any given day. For over 35 years, Dr. Shapiro has prepared clinicians to work in the field of speech, language, pathology, and particularly to work with people who stutter and with their families. He has provided instructional workshops locally throughout North Carolina, nationally and internationally. His work has both saved lives and changed lives through service and research. He has been a mentor to patients and students he has built bridges between communities and nations for the sake of improving care worldwide. Dr. Shapiro has empowered the voice of countless individuals who stutter all over the world, enabling them to take an active role in what many believe is the essence of humanity, communication. As Dr. Shapiro stated, communication is what sets us apart as human beings, and our story is the universal story of human triumph. Throughout his textbook, numerous publications, and very long career in education, Dr. Shapiro's experience and the impact that he has had on patients and professionals around the world embodies all that this award stands for. Now please join me in viewing a short video to introduce you to Dr. Shapiro and his amazing work.
My name is David Shapiro, and I'm a professor here at Western Carolina University. I've been in the communication sciences and disorders department since 1984. My motivation for being a speech language pathologist now for 39 years is uh, is both professional, but it is, as you say, it is quite personal. Being a person who stutters adds quite a complexity to just the process of growing up. It's a difficult way to grow up, to be unable to communicate with others. Hey, how, how are you? you? Yeah, nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you, Mike. My name's Taylor. Okay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Well, I started stuttering at the age of six. Um, and went through speech therapy in schools, um, private practices. Is it worth working to accomplish something where others don't have to do that work? Right. My job as a clinician and my job as a teacher is to create opportunities for the person I'm working with to achieve success. Okay, that's what I do. When people experience success, they come to uh, feel a sense of empowerment. Communications is one of the best gifts. You know, you're able to voice your opinion, you're able to, um, you know, to tell someone you love them or to, to let people know that, that you're upset or concerned. I mean, it's, it's, it's huge. Dr. Shapiro has firsthand knowledge of life with a stutter. Growing up, he struggled with communicating with others and became more isolated to avoid speaking to the outside world. My grandfather was there. He learned through my eyes how much I enjoyed walking with Buddy by the stream. Once when we were walking and he was holding my hand and I was stuttering severely, I remember this, and he said to me, um, I love you just the way you are. It was his grandfather and man's best friend who helped Dr. Shapiro through those hard times. Sometimes people don't know that Someone who stutters can speak very fluently when speaking with a pet, and thank goodness for that dog, Buddy. Um, Buddy and I took long walks often in the woods where I grew up, and sometimes stuttering became so challenging. That knowledge of isolation for people who stutter helps Dr. Shapiro relate to his clients and to encourage their speech progression. Some of the students Dr. Shapiro teaches in the classroom are also his clients working toward their own communication fluency. When I learned of Dr. Shapiro's own path to becoming a speech-language pathologist, I was impressed that he drew from personal experience to overcome challenges. Through this work, he became a better therapist, teacher, mentor, and advocate for others who struggle to communicate. When I first met him and he told me that story, I was just so, so confused. I was like, man, how was his stutter that bad? And he can speak so greatly now. And it's like, he's been a source of like, of a motivation for myself because to see how bad his was and see that now he's talking in front of committees. One of the big impacts of course is not just on our students and faculty and staff here at Western but on the professionals that David has worked with over the years uh, in many many continents and, and really across the world to be able to to help people who can then help other people uh, in things like stuttering or other communication disorders. Dr. Shapiro has written a textbook called Stuttering Intervention which is recognized as one of the leading guidebooks to help speech pathologists work with clients who stutter. Stuttering is a universal truth across uh, languages, across cultures, across countries. We find stuttering everywhere. I think he is one of the real pioneers taking it from the point where communication becomes the avenue through which he looks at it. And how do we help people, and in this case the communication impaired person, through a collaborative journey. While stuttering can seem mysterious, there is a, a route to a positive solution, and that's why knowledgeable speech-language pathologists can be of help. I hope that perhaps if this message is heard by folks who stutter, that they will seek help. He went above and beyond with me especially. I mean, he took time, countless hours, many late nights here in the building practicing for presentations, practicing for interviews, practicing for every kind of speech imaginable. And, um, I just feel lucky because, and it, so it made me see like how I need to give back as well. Yeah, because he is the king, I, I tell you, the king of, of speech therapy. And it's, it's awesome that I can, I can work with the king. He represents <laughs> the fact that the teaching and research of our faculty matters locally and worldwide. It's an honor to congratulate Dr. Shapiro on his selection as an O. Max Garner Award winner
for 2016. I've always done my best, imperfect as I clearly know I am, to bring pride and perhaps honor to this university, to my discipline, to this country as I travel the world, and perhaps even most importantly to me, uh, to my family. And I hope this recognition is consistent with that wish to bring pride and honor to others. Dr. Shapiro, could you join us at the at the podium? Let's come right over here before we give you this look. Good. Now, wait a minute, I have the more important <laughs> document. <Yeah. laughs> this is yours as well. Thanks again. Thanks for everything. President Spellings, Chairman Bissett, members of the Board of Governors, members of the Gardner family, Chancellor Belcher, distinguished friends and family, good morning. I am thrilled beyond words to be the recipient, to be a recipient of the 2016 Oliver Max Gardner Award and particularly to be a part of bringing this honor to the university I love. Western Carolina University. Sincerely, I express my gratitude to the selection committee for your endorsement from the University of North Carolina. Thanks also to UNC TV for assembling the footage we just viewed uh, for the first time. <laughs> In these few minutes, I want to address what is stuttering, my personal story, my professional activities, and the story that is Western Carolina University. Stuttering is a universal disorder of speech fluency. Stuttering interferes with the most human element of all, being able to tell one's story using the words one wants when one wants. In the USA alone, there are over three million people who stutter. In the world, there are over 70 million. James Earl Jones was quoted as saying, one of the hardest things in life is having words in your heart that you can't utter. There was a time, nearly my first 20 years, when stuttering consumed me. Stuttering was the basis on which I defined myself. Stuttering affected my relationships, my sense of my abilities, and what I thought I could become. My dog, as you saw, a buddy, was the only living thing to which I could communicate. Oddly, people who stutter can speak fluently with a pet or when alone just as they can sing without stuttering. I swore an oath that if I could find a way to talk, I would do my best to help others find their voice. I'm now completing my 39th year as a speech language pathologist, a specialist in fluency disorders, and a professor. I continue to be thrilled and thankful for the opportunities to serve and to learn from others near and far. Over the years, I've worked with many people. A man who never ordered a meal at a restaurant for his wife in their 40-year marriage now does so and communicates independently. 
a young woman who looked away and spoke little so that her boyfriend would not see her stutter, now looks him in the eye and says, he's going to hear what I have to say whether he wants to or not. <laughs> a child who stuttered severely and was bullied now speaks without hesitation and is an advocate for others. I have traveled to interesting places. With a colleague from France, I worked with people who stutter from 20 different African nations. I have met indigenous healers in huts with smoke and herbs and bones and learned about diviners and herbalists. Most importantly, I learned that our own view of the world is not necessarily shared. It represents a view, not the view. Over the last few years, I served as president of the International Fluency Association, heeding the advice of people who stutter for professionals to talk with us rather than about us. We coordinated the World Congress on Fluency Disorders where people who stutter and professionals gathered from six continents to share and to learn. We also brought current information and clinical service to countries where it had not existed previously. Indeed, it is the universal birthright of every person to be able to use speech and language freely and to experience communication freedom. It is difficult to capture nearly four decades of excitement into a few minutes. Indeed, I have had guiding lights. One such light is Western Carolina University where dreams are visualized and realized. The students, the best and the brightest, some of whom may not have the most competitive dossiers, some of whom represent the first in their family to go to college, come to a place that is inspired. With the able support of faculty and staff, they leave campus among the world's best leaders. The faculty have similar advantage. At Western Carolina University, there is a degree of freedom to thrive and to become. For me, Western Carolina University represents the American dream. You come as raw material. You work hard. You serve your community. You commit to learning and growing, and you prosper. To every dreamer, there is someone with a heart nearby. The day that changed my life was meeting Kay, my wife of 32 years, who gives every day, every moment, meaning and joy. That girl is my home. Our two children, Sarah and Aaron, are among my best teachers and sources of pride. Others who traveled here to share this moment all have nurtured me and guided me to make the right decisions. I can only offer my thanks. To receive this award is a dream beyond my imagination. Throughout my life and my work, I hope I have been successful in bringing honor and pride to my university, to my professional community, to people with fluency disorders worldwide, and particularly to my family. I believe that I would have brought pride to my grandfather, Joseph Lyman, who was an immigrant from Russia. He and all of you have encouraged me to dream, to work, and to serve. I will continue to do my best to bring pride to the legacy and to the family of Oliver Max Gardner, and always to give a voice to those who are silent. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Dr. Shapiro, for all that you do. Excellence and professionalism characterize today's Gardner Award recipient, our past recipients, and those who have made this award possible. This university is indeed blessed with great talent among its faculties and great devotion from its students, alumni, and friends. The profile of Professor Shapiro was produced by Jeff Smith of UNC TV and will be aired on North Carolina Now next Thursday, June 2nd at 8 p.m. So we look forward to seeing that uh, on UNC TV. The committee this year also selected Dr. Aziz Sanjar, the Sarah Graham Keenan Professor of Biochemistry and Biophysics in the School of Medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and the winner of the 2015 Alfred Nobel Prize in Chemistry for this year's Omax Gardner Award. So we have two fantastic recipients this year. Dr. Sanjar is out of the country today, so we will recognize him at our meeting in July. But why don't we take just a few minutes to, to recess and let everyone offer Dr. Shapiro their congratulations. We'll get, we'll get started in about five minutes. Thank you. There's one other person I, I wanted to recognize before we get started, and that's uh, Ed Broadwell, who is a former member of uh, the Board of Governors and is now the Chairman of the Board of Trustees at Western Carolina. So we have thanks for being here. See, there is life after the Board of Governors. <laughs> <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't give up. laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> okay, we will now consider the administrative action items listed as item nine on today's agenda. Uh, I understand that there are a couple of items that uh, have, have been asked by one of our board members to to remove for, for further discussion. Uh, where is Governor Cotus? Uh, those were items can, D and E. So why don't we remove those and I will entertain a motion at this time, unless there are other items. Uh, was it D or D? It was D, D as in and E, D and E. Uh, so, any other items from any board members? If not, I will entertain a motion to approve the administrative action items by consent, except for items D and E. Second. We have a motion and second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And now we can uh, have a short discussion of D and E. Marty? So on item D um, in your package, it deals with uh, capital improvements of approximately $50 million linked to another $90 million um, out there. So $140 million in total. And I appreciate the uh, concept of streamlining our package as someone that reads a lot of it. Um, but uh, two pages of information for $140 million worth of approvals is not quite enough uh, for me. Um, I'd like for the information that we had previously be provided, and, and um, Chair Smith has uh, said that on the next package he'll, he'll be providing that, so I appreciate that. Um, but another thing that I think we need to be mindful of is the impact of these various decisions on tuition fees, uh, parking, housing cost, just so that we get a full picture of these expenses as we incur them. We just approved a, a billion dollars in the Connect NC bond, and this is 140 million, so um, it's, it's a big number. So for that reason, uh, symbolically, I will vote against this item. That was item D. Uh, we'll, I'll entertain a motion to approve item D. A motion. Do second. I have a second. Any discussion? Harry, do you have any? No, I mean, I, Marty, Marty makes, makes uh, great points as always. And, um, you know, I think it's uh, contingent upon us to understand these things go through multiple layers of approval before they get to the Board of Governors. And uh, I, I, I uh, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for that process. You know, when you look at the campus level, uh, incredible, capable board of trustees, uh, GA vets this stuff out, and then it gets here. So, uh, and you know, all these projects, 
um, are, uh, are great projects for the campus. I think we understand the investment and the economic impact the campuses make. And, and Marty, as always, makes great points. Um, but uh, I'm really good with all this. I appreciate the attention that uh, Marty uh, gives to these items. It's, it's amazing, and, uh, and, and it's really a good thing because I can assure you nothing gets by Governor Cotis. <laughs> so all in favor. 33-minute meeting yesterday. Uh, all in favor of item. That's because he was not there. I, know, <laughs> no, I, kept, I kept saying, when's that planning get out? <laughs> All in favor of item D indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. We have uh, carries, the motion carries. Uh, and would you like your, your no votes noted in the minutes? Yes, please. Okay. Who else was that? Tom? Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. If you'd make that. All right, Marty, item E. Item E is an item I've been following since uh, 2013. Um, I appreciate that it's a, a gift. Um, to the university, and um, I think overall it's a, a very good project. Um, there were a couple things along the way that are a little bit odd about it. Um, it was structured in a way, or the gift was structured to encourage the legislature to approve uh, the, um, the planning for this earlier. And so I understand kind of the gamesmanship of that. But there's a last wrinkle that's been added that just popped up on our um, approval uh, for today which is upon the completion of the facility, the grantor has requested the right to lease any then vacant portion of existing buildings not to exceed 10%. And I understand that's at a below market rate. So those sorts of decisions definitely impact uh, the university. And I understand from the discussions in um, budget finance that they don't think that this will actually occur, but when someone <coughs> puts something in writing that says it probably won't happen, um, there are plenty of lawyers around the room. You, you kind of get your... Uh, concerns up about that. So for that reason, um, I'll be voting against this item. Uh, Harry, do you want to? Yeah, but, um, again, Marty uh, uh, does his homework. Uh, this, this item has gone before Council State Joint Legislative Oversight and is consistent with, with, uh, with board policy. And um, so I'm, I'm very comfortable with it as well. Thank Mr. you both. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Could somebody yeah. explain to me why we would be leasing something at below market rate? I'm just I'm new and I don't think that was discussed anywhere in the material. Jonathan. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, this was a, a, a condition of the, the gift of the property to the university. So in return for the gift of the nine acres that are strategically located um, and where this facility will be constructed, this lease arrangement was part of that, that negotiation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes, Marty. So, and I understand that. I, I wish that that had been communicated to the legislature before when they asked for the $5 million in advance planning um, for this instead of inserted kind of at the last minute for the, the gift, though I appreciate the, the gift to the university for sure. Okay. Any other discussion? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve item E. Or second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No. Okay, we have uh, two uh, nays. Um, thank you both. Thank you, everybody. That was, that was a good discussion and things we need to continuously think about as we approve these projects. Okay, let's move ahead to the committee reports. Uh, we'll start with audit since uh, Chairman uh, uh, Davenport scheduled his meeting for before daylight this morning, and, um, and, I, and I know how much he loves those early audit meetings on Friday mornings. So, Walter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will tell you that the, the uh, members of the committee left the reception early last night to be at the meeting this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman Bissett, members of the Board of Governors, doing its 8 o'clock meeting this morning, the Committee on Audit, Risk Management, and Compliance received an annual update from our State Auditor, Beth Woods, <clears throat> on audits that have been released by the Office of State Audit for the 2015 fiscal year. In the financial and compliance audits released by the State Auditor, two institutions had audit findings reported. All total, four findings were reported across the system, which is a significant improvement from past years. 
The state auditor is here today to deliver her annual update to the full board. At this time, I introduce to you State Auditor Beth Woods. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I must say that earlier when you stood up here and said that you were going to get into the biggest highlight of the annual meeting, I just knew you were getting ready to introduce well, me <laughs> and my audit report. I was a little dismayed to be out and see I was going to be upstaged by that award. <laughs> The State Auditor's Office did um, complete its audits for the um, fiscal year June 30, 2015. Um, we were, um, I'm glad to say, we finished all of the um, financial statement audits for the 16 universities by December 31st for all 16 universities except one. So that is a great improvement over when I became State Auditor um, back in 2009. We were issuing two by December 31st, and now we have gotten to um, where we're releasing all of them, um, other than just the one this year. We had clean opinions on all 16 universities, which is a great thing, um, and we had um, one finding um, for one of our universities. Um, we also completed the um, federal compliance audits for the universities. Um, we looked at the federal grant higher education which is about $40 million. We looked at student financial aid, which was $2.3 billion, but that covers the universities and the community colleges, and we looked at $800 million of research and development um, grants. And over those, while we um, render an opinion on the financial statements institution by institution, the federal grant audit that we do is statewide. Uh, but even at that, we had two findings in student financial aid, and we had one finding in research and development. I'm also happy to say this year we do look at um, information technology. We look at um, computer systems that process the federal grant money and process the financial information for the universities. This year, the State Auditor's Office was able to perform two information technology general controls audits at two of our universities across the system. This has not been um, audits that we've had the resources to do in the past, but now have them. And the findings were um, eye-opening. We presented those findings to the audit committee in January. But again, uh, we think that this is information. And, and what we're covering are security issues for data that has uh, data that's within our university that's, that's other than uh, financial information or um, uh, federal grant information. We're looking at change management controls, um, computer systems, that the programming will have changes made to it, making sure that's done in a uh, methodical way that requires all the right approvals. Um, we're looking at physical security of our uh, hardware and the data. So again, we were able to per, uh, perform two information technology um, general controls audits this past year and looking to do more of these um, in the future as it is a huge concern of the audit committee and I'm sure all of you. Um, we did not have any investigative reports that we released this year. However, we did assist UNCGA on um, an investigation at one of our universities and they released the report but our office worked very closely with them. So Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report on the audits that the State Auditor's Office has done. But I will tell you this, we continue to be committed to hiring um, the best and the brightest in the State Auditor's Office. We do continue to be committed to making sure that they're performing um, the audits that this Board of Governors would expect. And we, contend to, um, we intend to continue performing the great work that we've always done under this administration. I tell my staff all the time, I am not the mom who says her children are perfect. So we hold our auditors um, to a high uh, standards uh, as far as the work that they perform, making sure that's efficient, but also effective, that the quality of the audits that you would expect are there so that when we issue those clean opinions, you and the users of those financial statements can stand behind those opinions. I thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, State Auditor Wood. Mr. Chair, that completes my report.
Thank you, Mr. Davenport. And Beth, your visits are a highlight of, uh, <laughs> for, for our meetings, and we really appreciate the services that your office provides to the university. So thank you very much. Uh, now call on Mr. Smith for the report of the Committee on Budget and Finance. 33 minutes. <laughs> Chant was on vacation. <laughs> Marty was in ed planning. <laughs> You think that was planned? Um, it was not planned, Marty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman, Committee on Budget and Finance, and Board of Governor members. During this meeting yesterday, the Committee on Budget and Finance received an update on the 2016-17 budget by Associate Vice President Andrea Poole. In addition, Ms. Poole gave a report on the amount of need-based aid from tuition and the latest versions of campus tuition bill statements. A summary sheet of need-based aid funded from set-aside tuition and the institution's tuition bill statements were also reviewed. Associate Vice President Michael Vaughn presented the 2014-15 UNC Consolidated Financial Report. I've said it and I'll say it again. If you haven't looked at it, take the time to. It's, it's really great. Uh, Scott, who is on the live feed, uh, when we first got on, I kept saying, where's the financials? Uh, and just incredible job by JP and his team. This report included a consolidation of the University of North Carolina as a whole, a side-by-side -side comparison of institutional financial statements, selected disclosures, and other financially related information. The committee then received an information report on the policy review project in which the Committee on Budget and Finance will be responsible for policy deregulation in the areas of capital construction, real property, and contracting. The Committee on Budget and Finance will consider the revisions to be presented by the President's staff and make appropriate recommendations to the Board of Governors. This will be considered over several meetings, but is expected to be completed by December 2016. In order to improve the efficiency of the Board of Governors Committee meetings, on Monday, the Budget and Finance Committee held a meeting by conference call to consider and address routine administrative and transactional items. The items approved at the meeting were on consent agenda, approved earlier today. Thank you, Chairman Bizet. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Smith. That was very good. Three minutes. Uh, uh, call on Mrs. Nelson for the report of the Committee on Ed Planning Policies and Programs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. During the Ed Planning meeting yesterday, we heard from Leslie Boney a report on the Global Certificate Initiative. The International Program Subcommittee of the Board recommended in 2015 that UNC institutions explore strategies to increase the number of students graduating with a set of courses and experiences that would result in their being more globally ready upon graduation. This global certificate would be an example of a stackable credential, which we heard about yesterday. The committee heard a proposed revision to policy 700.1.1 regarding minimum admissions requirements. The college board has deployed a revised version of the SAT resulting in a scoring shift. In order to maintain the equivalent minimum SAT score, a technical correction is required to clarify that the minimum required score will be an 800 on the old version of the test or the equivalent on the new version. The committee recommended this amendment as presented, and it will, it will be on the consent agenda at the next Board of Governors meeting. Dr. Elisa Chapman presented an update on the implementation of the Board's recommendations on teacher and school leader quality. As a reminder, the university meets approximately 40% of the state's need for 10,000 new K-12 teachers per year, and despite our state's continuing population growth and increasing demand for teachers, our schools of education have seen a 30% decline in enrollment since 2010. In collaboration with UNC's 15 schools of education, the Academic and University Programs Division is emphasizing greater public accountability, research-based approaches, increased collaboration, expanded and enhanced clinical practice, increased use of valid teacher performance assessments, strengthened recruitment and selection of prospective students, and improved support for early career educators. Finally, licensure and degree programs approved on our Monday conference call were on the consent agenda approved earlier today. Thank you, Mr. Bissett. This concludes our report. Thank you, Anna.
now call on Mrs. McNeil for the report of the Committee on University Governance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Committee on University Governance has several items for your information and two items for a vote. As you have heard and will hear from other committees, the Board is undertaking a policy review project. The Committee on University Governance will act as the steering committee for this project. The committee will coordinate technical corrections and updates to the UNC policy manual involving other standing committees as appropriate for the subject matter. In support of that goal, the committee today voted to recommend a revision to policy 100.2, adoption of the policy manual, rescission and prior policies of prior policies and promulgation of policies. A lot of policies. A copy of the red line policy is in your notebook and will be on the consent agenda for the July 29th meeting. The committee has two items that require a vote. UNC Press has three positions on its Board of Governors for five-year terms ending June 30th, 2021. According to its bylaws, the Press BOG creates a nominating committee and submits a slate to Chancellor of the UN, to the Chancellor of the UNC Chapel Hill, who then transmits it to the UNC President System, System President, who presents it to the UNC Board of Governors. It's very clear. Following the recommendation of UNC Press, UNC Chapel Hill Chancellor Fault, and President Spellings, the Governance Committee recommends one new appointment, Dr. Elizabeth Engelhart, John Shelton Reed, Distinguished Professor of Southern Studies at UNC Chapel Hill, and two reappointments, Dr. Eric Muller, Dan K. Moore, Distinguished Professor, UNC School of Law, UNC Chapel Hill, and Dr. Linda K. Hanley Bowden, William Neal Reynolds Professor of Biochemistry, North Carolina State University. All three appointments are effective July 1st, 2016 for five years and their resumes are in your folders. This requires a vote. Thank you. You've heard the committee's recommendation. Any discussion? If not, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. UNCTV has five vacant positions on its boards of trustees. On behalf of the Governance Committee, I recommend the reappointments of Donald Coleman and William Mance and the new appointments of Joel Butler and Cully Tarleton. All four appointments are effective July 1st, 2016 for four years, and their resumes are also in your folders. Thank you. You've heard the committee's recommendation. Any discussion on uh, this item? If not, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And to close, I want to thank all of you once again for giving greetings at the graduation ceremonies in these past few weeks. They are such wonderful, positive, happy events. And it is very important to our campuses that the board be part of their ceremonies. And more important, that we recognize the absolutely great faculty who this time around received those teaching awards that were totally um, a wonderful thing to, uh, to, to, to have. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. This concludes my remarks. Thank you very much, Joan. Uh, now call on uh, Mr. Powers for the report of the Committee on Public Affairs. There's been some comment in the press that uh, Mr. Mr. Powers' fashion advisor is Norm Sloan. So uh, I just wanted to be sure everybody saw that. <laughs> so today I chose. <laughs> Some of you, uh, uh, Madam President, uh, the late and former basketball coach at North Carolina State was famous for wearing very loud plaid jackets on the sidelines in his tenure at North Carolina State and then at University of Florida. 
But uh, so today I chose to wear something very light and summery in, in celebration of a transparent, free, and unbiased press, uh, <laughs> as, as symbolized by my friend Ray Gronberg from the, Dur from the Durham Herald Sun. So Ray, thank you very much for representing the press well today. Um, I also want to take a quick moment to, uh, again, say congratulations to Madeline Finnegan and welcome her aboard. I've had a chance to talk with Madeline on several occasions. Really excited about working with her. You've got very big shoes to fill from my friend Zach, who I've really enjoyed working with, but you're going to be a great addition. And if you'll allow my, pardon my momentary lapse into part, partisanship, uh, I will say it is the third straight Board of Governors oh. member who is a student at the North Carolina State University. So, <laughs> so evidently, Chancellor Woodson has discovered the leadership, the, the right leadership plan over there. So, Mr. Chairman, during the meeting yesterday, the Committee on Public Affairs received updates on state and uh, the state of the legislative session as well as the federal legislative session. The Committee on Public Affairs heard from the VP for State Government Relations, Drew Moretz, about the status of the state budget. <clears throat> Since our last meeting, the legislator has returned, has been working at a breakneck pace. On May 19th, the House passed a budget that included a number of positive outcomes for UNC. The House proposed budget included a 2% across the board raise for employees and staff, faculty, a 500, plus a $500 merit-based bonus. The budget also returned very good news. UNC's 50% share of repair and renovations money, which, which proposes right now it's $164 million total, so we'd have half of that, which is the largest we've had in recent years. Additionally, two of our top policy requests were included in the budget, the recommendation to the, including the recommendation to delay the NC GAP admission, guaranteed admission program, which the president had worked out with the president of the community college system and the House and Senate education leadership. The requested permanent fix for UNC's pension concern was also included in the House budget. <clears throat> the budget debate now moves to the Senate. The committees also received additional information about another issue with, with potential to impact University of North Carolina, Senator Tom Apodaca's Affordable and, Succe and Accessible Education Act. The president and many chancellors continue to engage with Senate leadership to ensure the best final outcome. As a reminder to you all, remember June 14th is University Day at the Legislature in Raleigh. We hope you will all attend. This allows us an opportunity to share our appreciation for the work the Legislature does on our behalf and to share our concerns about issues that affect us before them. We also heard an update from Vice President of Federal Relations, Kimry Reinhart. Uh, fairly quiet on the federal front right now, but Kimry did remind us that June 6th is the congressional primary in North Carolina. As you all recall, it was, uh, the districts were redrawn and it was put off from the original March date. So please remember to do your civic duty and vote on June 6th. Um, also, Congress continues to work on must-do legislation throughout the summer, until the summer recess. House and Senate leadership are working on, are waiting on general election results before considering any more major policy questions in the lame duck session. Mr. Chairman, we have no vote, no items for vote today, only for information, and this will conclude my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Powers, and thank you and your committee for all you're doing. Uh, legislature's in session and for trying to work very closely with them on bills that affect uh, the university and appreciate everything that you're doing. Uh, I'd now like to call on Mr. Granger for the report of the Strategic Planning Committee. Frank? Good morning, Chairman Bissett and Board of Governors members. It is a meeting on Tuesday, May the 24th. The Strategy Planning Committee reviewed a work plan and calendar designed to guide the strategic priorities process. President Spelling discussed several overchanging events for the activity. Highlight of this work plans included reinforcing the five consensus themes as the foundation, engaging chancellors and other university stakeholders, using board of governors standing committees as the vehicle 
for generating goals, actions, and metrics related to the theme. Using consistent template to build our theme. Recommendations. Provide a timeline of major activities and deliverable for the 2016-17 Board of Governors meeting. UNC General Administration staff will be holding work, a workshop for committees, chairs, chancellors in June to discuss work plans, parameters, and explanation in the more detail. This work is critical to developing our 2017 budget and legislative policy priorities. At this time, on behalf of the strategy planning committee, I move that the Board of Governors approve the work plan and calendar that is included in your folder. Thank you, Mr. Granger. You've heard the report of the committee. Any uh, discussion? If not, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Frank. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, we look forward to working side by side with the President, the Spellings, and the Chancellors at the entire university community and developing the best high, higher education strategy plan in the nation. Thank you, Chairman Bissett. This concludes my report for today. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, this time I'd like to call on Mr. Long for the report of the Special Committee on Military Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I first want to uh, relay Mr. Powers' request that I correct him that the congressional primary is June 7, not June 6. <laughs> the people from Chapel Hill have to correct some of our state colleagues every once in a while. <laughs> They're not very the good. Chapel Hill grad wrote this. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Bissett and Board of Governors members and guests. During its meeting yesterday, the Special Committee on Military Affairs received, uh, reviewed the actions taken by the committee since its formation in June 2013. As a special committee, it has, been, it has a term of one year, but that term has been extended twice, and so the committee has now been in operation for three years. The committee is now drafting its final report, and the meeting, at the meeting yesterday, the committee reviewed the implementation of the board's policy on military student success, which was adopted in 2013, and the efforts of several campuses to implement that, po that policy. That included yesterday an informational report from Chancellor Frank Gilliam on the efforts taking place at UNC Greensboro including the award of academic credit for military training, such as credit for training in their nursing program. And Chancellor Grillam relayed how uh, service personnel are enhancing the educational experience of other students. The committee also received an informational report from Anne Marie Bell, director of UNC Wilmington's Onslow Extension Site, and Bill Kowzinski, director of military affairs, both, both of them at UNC Wilmington, on the efforts taking place at UNC Wilmington to support military affiliated students, including the development of veterans lounges, a lounge and development of academic programs for soldiers at Camp Lejeune. Uh, also yesterday, UNC trustee, UNC Chapel Hill trustee, Haywood Cochran reported that space has been attained in Chapel Hill for a veterans center at that university. The committee chairman, that was me, reported that President Spellings intends to hold an annual conference of military affairs representatives from each campus. And, she, and also, uh, she has assured me that she will include the efforts to support military students in the strategic directions plan that we will be developing. Finally, the committee asked general administration staff to prepare a summary activity report on the committee's work for presentation to the Committee on Education, Planning, Policies, and Programs 
and that policy, that report will be delivered in July 2016. Thomas Jefferson once said that from time to time the tree of liberty must be watered with the blood of tyrants and patriots, and this Memorial Day we can rededicate ourselves to serving those patriots who defend our country by making our institutions of higher education available to them, not just because these patriots enhance our classrooms, which they do, and we saw yesterday, or we feel a sense of obligation, but because they are defenders of the freedoms that we cherish. And deep down, we do this work because we love our country. Mr. Chairman, it's been an honor for all of us to be part of this work, and thank you very much for the, for the opportunity to, to have a committee to operate in this way. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Long, and, and thank you to your committee members. Um, I, I want everybody to understand that this, this is a, a restructuring of our effort. It has nothing to do with the priority that this system gives to our veterans. And we actually believe that by uh, pushing this to the campuses, we will actually be able to provide a, a, a better and more efficient service. Uh, but make no mistake, this will remain one of our highest priorities in the system. So I want you to understand that. This is uh, the final meeting of the committee here, but we will get reports from time to time on the efforts that are going on in the campus. Uh, I'd also like, in, in addition to Steve and the committee, I'd also like to thank uh, Kimry Reinhart and Kerry Dick Dixon, who supported the committee. And I, I think this committee served an incredible purpose. It, it raised uh, this issue to, uh, to the board and, and to the, the university community, and I, I think uh, we've done a, a good thing here, Steve, and I, I thank you very much. Uh, I'll have a... Uh, I'll Mr. Chairman, can I just say that? Yes. I've talked extensively with President Spellings, and we're going to continue that work as we go forward. So we've, and both of you have committed to that, and I appreciate very much your commitments. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of, uh, I'm, I have a very short uh, chairman's report. Uh, I would like to uh, recognize and uh, thank uh, Representative Fraley for being with us again today. His attendance here is very much appreciated. I think he gets uh, a full understanding of what we're trying to do, and, and we appreciate his efforts very, very much. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, I would also... Um, like to comment briefly on the meeting process that we've had this this time. I personally think it's been very productive. I thought our session yesterday was was it was very good and incredible. And if we can continue to do that and incorporate what we learned from those sessions into our strategic planning process, we're going to be a, a long way down the road. And that's what this board said we wanted to do. We wanted to spend more time on the big issues. And I think we've done that. And I think not only are we we're going to be more productive, but I think it's going to be a more enjoyable experience for our board and for the staff and for our chancellors. So thank you all very much for participating in that. I'm sure we'll be tweaking it as we go down the road, but I thought our first meeting was, was great. Uh, we, as you know, we're going to have our comment first uh, public comment session uh, after this meeting. I want to thank Laura Wiley for all she's done to get ready for that. I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I, think it, I think that's going to be a great, uh, a great event. So we'll see what happens today, Laura. So good. And thank you. Thank, as you know, Laura's got some people. We're trying to have enough people from each committee so that we'll have a broad representation from the board. But everybody is invited to attend. And I, I'm, not, I'm not a member of the, of the group that's going to be there, but I'll I want to be there for a while to see, at least to see how this goes. So I hope some of you will do that as well. Uh, I would like to recognize that for three of, uh, of our members, their terms as committee chair are ending. Uh, Joan McNeil, governance, Harry Smith of budget and finance, and G.A. Sawasnik of personnel and tenure. And I want to thank you all for your, your service. You, they've served their two years, and under our policy, that's, that's the limit. But uh, 
We will expect you to continue to be continuous, continuously involved in the operations of those committees as we go, go forward. But you've set a high bar for the next group of committee chairs. In the next several weeks, uh, I, in, in conjunction with Vice Chairman Aiken and Secretary Perry, uh, and, and in, in conjunction with all of you, I'm trying to get around and talk to everybody to see what your interests are for the next year. Uh, so we will be trying to get these committees in place by mid-June because of, of the horrendous schedule that the president has put us on. Uh, uh, and so, uh, you know, as, as a, um, uh, you know, I, I thought this, when I watched some of the others, when I watched Hannah, she did it so easily, it was such a simple thing. But now that I've, I've had to look at the code and the policy, it's a, it's a much more difficult process than you could ever imagine. Um, as a reminder, the code requires each voting member of the board to serve on either budget or finance, ed planning, personnel and tenure, or governance. And so board members uh, also will be assigned to strategic planning, public affairs, and audit. It's a complex uh, process. Uh, members generally s serve two years to on an assigned committee, but the code requires that the chair work to ensure that the voting membership of each committee is divided into two classes with the terms of approximately one half of the members expiring each year. Now, Terrence, you see how this, you see where this is going. Uh, uh, to achieve balance and efficiencies in the committee system, the code provides that the chair may appoint members to one-year terms or reassign members who have served one year of a two-year term. I've been trying to speak with all of you. I haven't gotten around to everybody yet, but believe me, I will. And we'll talk about your preferences and uh, uh, I'll hope to come out of this process unscarred. So, uh, <laughs> although I doubt it. But uh, I'm going to try to get uh, Secretary Perry and Vice Chairman Aiken to explain the, the policy to me, and then I'll, <laughs> then I'll proceed with that. Uh, President Spellings, um, I believe you have a couple of people who you wish to recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise to recognize our four presidential interns for the 2015-2016 academic year, Brooks Artis, Paige Marley, South Moore, and James Whalen. Will you all so please stand? Uh, <laughs> I have seen a lot of them over the past year, and I want to talk a little bit about some of them, their accomplishments, and their notable post-college plans. Brooks, artists, why don't you, you all stay standing while I talk about you from Greensboro. Uh, received her B.S. in English Creative Writing from North Carolina State University. <laughs> Again, during her time at GA, Brooks worked with Brent Heron to create a survey that was used to assess threat assessment teams on each university in the system. She also assisted with the recruitment process for the Marion Drain Graham Scholars and the incoming presidential interns. Brooks will be attending Clemson University in the fall to pursue her master's degree in higher education administration. Thank you, Brooks. Paige Marley is a recent Honors College graduate of Appalachian State University, having pursued a BS in political science and a BA in global studies with concentrations in comparative politics and globalization and development in Latin America. And during her time as a presidential intern, Paige worked with Dr. Mike Michelle Solar on the CBE Summit and worked with the Advancement Council for their quarterly meetings. Paige also had a hand in organizing our Global Connections reports and in the fall, Paige will pursue her master's degree in public co policy at Georgetown University. Congratulations, Paige. South Moore from Murfreesboro, North Carolina, received a BA with highest distinction in political science and social economic justice from UNC Chapel Hill. Alongside Roger Sims, South helped plan and manage College Application Week, launching a successful marketing campaign that greatly boosted participation of high school students. In fact, more applications were submitted this year than ever before, over 75,000. 
South was instrumental in working with University Advancement to register each of our campuses and their foundations to solicit donations from all 50 states. South will attend Duke University School of Law in the fall. Congratulations, South. And finally, James Whalen from Charlotte, North Carolina, completed his BA in Mathematics and Philosophy at UNC Asheville. James conducted pedagogical research on multiple forms of experiential learning, using his research to argue for expansion of internship, undergraduate research, study abroad, and service learning experiences across the UNC system. He also helped to develop programs with large corporations, small businesses, and public and private HBCUs to dramatically increase the number of internships available to students. After his internship at UNCGA, James will work with Cynthia Ball, North Carolina House District 49 campaign as the field director and policy advisor. I could go on about each of them even further, but you all have left a lasting impact on general administration in this university. We thank you for your great work and public service, and congratulations on all the wonderful things that lie ahead for each of you. Thank you. Thank you, President Spellings. I would also like to recommend, recognize some special guests in the audience. The 2016 class of Marion Drain Graham Scholars. This prestigious program, which is in its fourth year, was founded by the Frank Porter Graham family to honor, honor the Senator's wife, Marion. In keeping with the values held so deeply by the Graham family, the program offers recipients the opportunity to explore issues facing higher education while serving North Carolina and developing the skills that define truly courageous leaders. In addition to completing a six-week internship at a state agency, scholars spend time learning about key issues in higher education in the UNC General Administration's offices, on the campuses of our constituent institutions, and even from policymakers in state and federal government. The program concludes with each scholar giving a capstone presentation that combines independent research with the experience they gained during the internship. These six scholars have been chosen from amongst the brightest, most public service-minded students in our system, and they are an impressive group. So I would like for them to stand as I int introduce them. Kelly Forbes, Kelly, there's Kelly. A rising junior at East Carolina University, studying nursing and an East Carolina scholar. In addition to her coursework, she serves as a lead chemistry tutor at the Pirate Academic Success Center and works as a certified nurse aide. Kelly will be working at the NC State University Institute for Emerging Leaders. Kelly, congratulations. Ashley Lawson, a rising junior at North Carolina State University, where she is a secondary mathematics education and mathematics double major and a park scholar. A lot of park scholars around here. <laughs> she is a researcher at the, at the SMART Collaborative, an interdisciplinary team of educators working to make schools places where students want to learn. She is also director of a hip hop group. I didn't know about that. <laughs> and a dance instructor at a studio in Raleigh. Ashley will be working at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Congratulations to you, Ashley. Clifford Parker, a rising senior and business administration major at Fayetteville State University. Clifford is a student assistant to the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and is president of his campus chapter of the Alpha Phi Omega fraternity. He will be working at the North Carolina Community College System. Clifford, congratulations to you. Uh, Kiana Rivers, a rising senior studying criminal, Kiana? A rising senior studying criminal justice at Elizabeth City State University. She is the president of the ECSU chapter of the NAACP and is a vice president of the NCAA, NAACP 
youth and college division. This past year, she served as a residence advisor and president of her junior class. Kiana will be working at the State Education Assistance Authority. Congratulations and have a great summer there. I know you will. And finally, oh no, not finally. <laughs> Next, Ferris Smith, a rising senior at UNC Wilmington studying history and campaign management. She is a research assistant for UNC Wilmington's student-led political television program, Wingspan. Ferris will be working at the UNC Center for International Understanding, which was just renamed Go Global NC. Congratulations. And now finally, Charlie White. Uh, Charlie, I know Charlie. <laughs> a rising senior studying French and political science at UNC Asheville, where he was recently elected student body president. Charlie is also a university ambassador working to convince prospective students to become a bulldog. Charlie will be working in the office of the North Carolina Secretary of State. Charlie, congratulations. These are remarkably talented students who could be doing any, any number of amazing things this summer. You know, they could be at the beach, on the beach, you know. <laughs> so I'm very pleased that they've elected to stay here, serve the state, and learn more about higher education. I hope this, that this experience will inspire you to become the next generation of leaders for this university. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Uh, before we proceed, President Spellings has one other thing she would like to say, and if we... I just want to publicly recognize Steve Ballard. Steve, will you stand up? I know you're going to miss us. This is Steve's last uh, meeting with us. Uh, congratulations on your amazing service to this institution and to ECU. Twelve wonderful years of service. You've left the place much better than you found it, and we're all grateful to you. So if I could ask everybody to join me in a round of applause for Steve. Thank you, Steve, for, for all that you've done for the for East Carolina University and for this system. Uh, let's see. I, uh, since our last meeting, I've appointed the, the committee for the James G. Holzhauser Jr. Public Service Award. Anna Nelson has agreed to chair the committee, which will include Walter Davenport, Joe Knott, and Ann Maxwell. So thank you all for, for being a part of that. Uh, finally, I want to thank again everyone for the uh, excellent turnout at last night's uh, award dinner honoring uh, former President Tom Ross. Uh, once again, Rodney Hood, Ann Maxwell, Temple Sloan, and Laura Wiley did an incredible job of making this a, a really remarkable and memorable evening. And it was so good, in fact, that some of us who might want to have a party somewhere in the state have decided we, we've asked Rodney and his committee <laughs> to help us <laughs> because it was really fantastic. Uh, I have one, only one final announcement, and that is that the uh, next meeting of the Board of Governors is scheduled for Friday, July 29, 2016. You're in the boardroom, but don't think you can just leave after this meeting and go away because the strategic planning process will be beginning in June, and so I'll, I know I'll be seeing uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be seeing each other before July 29th. Thank you, President Spellings. You have any? Okay, I will now entertain a motion to approve the. Well, let's see. Wait a minute. I've got to, I've got to have a motion here from Secretary Perry to go into closed session. I, I, I know the board loves that motion. Well, so. this one is extra long, so bear with me. Oh, good. 
I move that we go into closed session to prevent the disclosure of information that is privileged or confidential pursuant to the law of this state or of the United States under Article 7 of Chapter 126 of the North Carolina General Statutes and 20 U.S.C. 1232 and 34 CFR Part 99 or not considered a public record within the meaning of Chapter 132 of the General Statutes. To consult with our attorneys to protect the attorney-client privilege and to consider and give instructions concerning a potential or actual claim, administrative procedure, or judicial action, including the following existing lawsuits. Carcano et al. versus McCrory, University of North Carolina Board of Governors, United States of America versus State of North Carolina, McCrory, North Carolina Department of Public Safety, University of North Carolina and Board of Governors of the University of North Carolina, and A.T. by his next friend and parent, H.T., versus University of North Carolina, Board of Governors of the University of North Carolina, W. Lewis Bissett, Jr., North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, Board of Trustees of the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, and Thomas J. Williams and to establish or instruct the staff or agents concerning the negotiations of the amount of compensation or other terms of an employment contract, and to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, or condition of appointment of a public officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee pursuant to section 143 through 318.11a, 1, 3, and 5 of the North Carolina General Statutes. Let me Incredible. Repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> could you could you repeat that? <laughs> Is there a second? Right. Thank you. All in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We'll take a short break while the room is clear. That's right. Upstairs, two seven. Well, hey, I think we're ready. I think he's gone. Do that later. I mean, really, that's yeah. They're flipping. Hey, I believe it. I believe you can do that. Okay, we'll reconvene in uh, open session. Um, I'll recognize Mr. Pickett for the report of the Committee on Personnel and Tenure. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman Bissett and Board of Governors members, during its meeting yesterday, the Personnel and Tenure Committee received brief updates from both academic affairs and human resources. Dr. Gonzalez introduced Kimberly Van Nort newly appointed Vice President for Academic Programs, Faculty and Research, who has joined General Administration. Mr. Brody mentioned that the working group on faculty salaries mentioned at our April meeting will make an initial report to P&T in late summer. The working group is comprised of General Administration staff from Human Resources, Finance, and Institutional Research. Mr. Brody also mentioned that recent federal regulatory changes to the, federal, to the Fair Labor Standards Act has raised the threshold at which employees can be considered exempt from overtime from $23,660 to $47,476 per year. The regulatory change will become effective December 1, 2016 and affects approximately 2,400 employees. The FLSA changes mean that these employees will either need to be compensated at time and a half for any work over 40 hours per week, will need to have their salaries raised to the new FLSA threshold of $47,476 or will need to have their work schedules adjusted. In response to committee member questions, Mr. Brody mentioned that chief human resources officers and university attorneys are having a conference call next week to discuss how to respond to these changes. It's premature to estimate the cost to the university at this time. Mr. Brody expects to have more concrete cost estimates late this calendar year. The committee then received an informational report on personnel actions delegated to the president. 
Following that, Mr. Brody updated the committee on proposed policy changes that affect the president's delegation in human resources related matters. These policy changes are part of a larger policy review initiative taking place among several other BOG committees. Mr. Brody mentioned that the changes affect three key areas. First, they will delegate all EHRA salary actions to the president, excluding salary actions related to the president herself, her senior level direct reports, chancellors, the CEO of UNC Healthcare, and the general manager of UNC TV. Second, the creation or modification of senior administrative and academic officer positions will be delegated to the president. And third, the policy change will empower the president to increase salary delegations to the constituent institutions. Following discussions, the committee approved the proposed delegations with an amendment to the increased salary adjustment approval threshold which gives the president the authority to approve or delegate all increases up to and including 20% and $15,000. Any proposed adjustment exceeding 20% and $15,000 will require committee pre-authorization. The committee acknowledged that existing higher delegations remain in place, such as the additional delegation for retentions, temporary increases, and interim appointments. The final policy changes will be placed on the board's July consent agenda. Thank you, Chairman Bissett. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Pickett. Uh, I know we, we've got, uh, I think Governor Goolsby has a motion that he would like to make in a few minutes, but I'd, I'd like to proceed and get the election out of the way because it's gonna, uh, before we get to that, and then we're, I promise you, we're getting close to the end. Uh, we'll now entertain nominations and hold an election for chairman, vice chairman, and secretary for the term of July 1, 2016 to June 30, 2018. This election will be held pursuant to University Policy 200.2, a copy of which is in your folders and all applicable statutes and rules. As you know, I'm a candidate for chair. Normally, I would turn the gavel over to Vice Chairman Aiken or Secretary Perry to preside. However, they are both candidates for re-election as well. Therefore, we've been advised uh, that the chair of the Committee on Go University Governance should preside. So, Joan, the gavel is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lou Bissett is a candidate for nomination for the Office of Chair. His candidacy is unopposed. Roger Aiken is candidate for nomination for the Office of Vice Chair. His candidacy is unopposed. Joan Perry is a candidate for nomination for the Office of Secretary. Her candidacy is unopposed. Because there is only one candidate for each office this year, I will entertain a motion to suspend the requirements of Part 4 of the election procedure and elect Mr. Bissett, Mr. Aiken, and Dr. Perry by acclamation. Madam Chair. I move that we suspend the requirements of Part 4 of Policy 200.2, the election procedures, and elect Mr. Bissett to the Office of Chair, Mr. Aiken to the Office of Vice Chair, Dr. Perry to the Office of Secretary. I the motion. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. And the motion carries. Congratulations, Chairman Bissett. Thank you very much, I think. Yes. <laughs> no, no speech, please. <laughs> no, 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 no speech. Uh, Chairman Bissett, the rumor is that um, Mr. Hood and committee are planning an extravagant <laughs> I couldn't be more Black pleased. <laughs> I couldn't be more pleased. Okay, this time I'm going to recognize uh, Governor Goolsby for uh, a matter he wants to bring Thank you, Mr. Bring, Chairman. Bring uh, us. Chap Mitchell could not be with us. Uh, he's traveling, and he texted me getting on the plane to London and asked that the motion he made last time be brought up again, and if I remember it correctly, and, and I will ask for help, uh, it is that the costs 
borne by the university system, that we request the General Assembly to set aside uh, appropriate funds, uh, well, let me think, I'm sorry, that, that the, the amount of projected litigation costs be taxed against the Attorney General's office at the amount of 150%. And to back up that motion, I will tell you that the law in North Carolina says, North Carolina General Statute 14-2, the duties of the, our Attorney General are to represent all state departments, agencies, institutions, commissions, bureaus, and other organized activity of the state, which receive support in whole or part from the state. He's been asked to represent us. He is denying representation. I know that Ms. Gage was concerned about, you know, the money does come from the state period. Our state allocates money to the Attorney General's office to actually provide for our defense. I think that the punitive aspect of an additional 50% on top of what the, the cost of our projected litigation expenses are shows our dissatisfaction with the fact that our Attorney General won't defend us in this matter. It is a matter where our university has been sued. It's a matter where we need representation and now we're being required to go outside to hire counsel. Again, it's just a vote by the board. It doesn't mean anything except it shows our dissatisfaction with the Attorney General's actions, asking the General Assembly to take action. And I submit that motion. Thank you, Mr. Goolsby. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Yes. So, a clarification on the <clears throat> wording of the motion. Well, I, well okay. Go, yeah, go ahead and do that. Okay. So, as I No, that the General Assembly take from the Attorney General's budget the projected costs of our defense to the amount of 150% of those projected costs. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, let, let, me, let me respond. Uh, you have before you a letter that I have just sent to Attorney General Cooper, and I'm going to read it to you. Uh, <laughs> The University of North Carolina and the Board of Governors have been named as defendants in two separate lawsuits filed in the United States District Court for the Middle District of North Carolina, challenging the Public Facilities Privacy and Security Act, commonly known as House Bill 2, which was passed by the North Carolina General Assembly and signed by Governor McCrory on March 23, 2016. On March 28, 2016, the American Civil Liberties Union of North Carolina and other individual plaintiffs, plaintiffs filed suit against me, the university, the Board of Governors of the University, and Governor McCrory, challenging House Bill 2 under the United States Constitution and Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, uh, the, the Carcano litigation. On May 9, 2016, the United States Justice Department, Department of Justice filed its own enforcement action challenging House Bill 2 in the Middle District. We'll call that the DOG litigation. Although the Attorney General ordinarily represents the university and its officials in litigation, your office has declined to provide legal representation to the university in these matters. As you can appreciate, the university is in need of representation by legal counsel in these matters so that it may continue its operation and focus its mission of educating students and serving the people of North Carolina. Accordingly, the university has retained outside counsel in both matters. The university will incur unanticipated and potentially significant legal costs as a result of your decision not to provide legal representation through your office, even while the university continues to pay your office for legal services. Accordingly, on behalf of the university, I am requesting that your office begin setting aside funds sufficient to pay the attorney's fees and expenses that, that the university will incur in defending these matters and work with us to ensure that the expenses are paid in full. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter, and I will look forward to your prompt consideration of my request. In addition to that, 
we've had conversations with the legislature related to the funding of these lawsuits because, as you can imagine, uh, representing uh, uh, retaining counsel of the stature that we have to retain in these matters is extremely uh, expensive. They probably charge more than uh, Governor Goolsby does per hour. I'm, I'm, I'm man. <laughs> but not not Governor so, Williford. So, <laughs> but not <laughs> Williford. As much as I do, I'll guarantee you. That. So, so this, this this is a serious matter for us, and and I. I uh, appreciate Governor Goolsby and, and Governor Mitchell's concerns. I think we have responded appropriately by our letter to the Attorney General and in our conversations with the legislature. I, I'm not sure that I, would I, that I would recommend that this board be advising the legislature on how to handle this matter. Uh, I think that's something they will have to determine. Uh, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna vote against this motion, and I hope uh, that a majority of you will join me in that. In Mr. That. Chairman, yes, I want to commend you for the letter you sent uh, to the Attorney General, who I can't think of any single basis that he would decline to represent this body, which neither enacted nor signed into law the legislation. Accordingly, I think it's appropriate for this body to go on record asking the legislature to not only set aside the cost, but to put a penalty in. I could see if we had done something in the course of making HB2 law that might give the Attorney General pause about representing us. But I intend to vote for it. I would encourage every other governor to do so. I just one other thing. I mean, I would prefer that you endorse the letter that I am sending to the attorney general. Uh, as you, you know, we all know this is a highly politicized time, year, and uh, I, I think we've approached this in the right way, in a measured way, and I, I, as I indicated, I'm going to vote against it. Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, yes. amend my motion to actually add to it that we also in that motion support the letter sent out by you on the 27th of May, 2016 to the Attorney General. Do I have a second on that? Um, I think from my perspective, um, the guidance of the chair that give the opportunity to From my perspective and with the guidance of the chair, I think we need to give this letter an opportunity to be responded to. If we are ignored or if we are told that they will not take any action to compensate us, then I think we proceed with more forceful language and uh, ask for the assistance of the legislature. Thank you. Marty. Um, city councils often pass resolutions that don't have any authority either, asking the legislature, supporting the legislature in different actions or not supporting the legislature in different actions. So I think this uh, motion is entirely appropriate. Because Attorney General uh, Roy Cooper's decision to decline to defend and represent the university in this lawsuit is a complete dereliction of duty. And it's coming at the expense of the university. And that means coming at the expense of the students. And I think in our efforts, and we've listed affordability and access as one of our primary objectives, uh, protecting our affordability by pointing out um, the lack of uh, another uh, agency to do their job and therefore effectively take budgeted expenses that would have gone to the university and instead shift them to their own department without any um, uh, kind of recourse is not appropriate. So I will be supporting this motion. Yes. Mr. Chairman, um, I certainly uh, agree with the sentiment of Mr. Goldsby's motion, Mr. Mitchell's motion don't disagree with uh, my fellow governor, uh, Mr. Cotus. However, I would point out to our members that our chairman has asked that the attorney general pay the legal fees or set aside funds from his budget to pay our legal expenses, if I read your letter correctly, Mr. Chairman. Right. Um, which I think uh, accomplishes our goal of protecting our students and protecting our institutions from the financial damages done by what seems to me also to be a dereliction of duty by an elected official. However, uh, before we 
go to step two and address the legislature, I think in working decently in or and in order, the first person to uh, be addressed would be the one who is our representative, asking him to reconsider. And if he will not reconsider, then he pay the uh, agree to pay the legal expenses would be the more measured and more appropriate uh, response from this board. So I, I would agree with the chairman on that. Any other comments? If not, uh, we're going to have a, uh, a vote by hands this time, I think. Let's make sure we understand exactly. Um, yes, Mr. Long. Um, the university shouldn't be in these lawsuits. We all know that. Um, I am concerned that we're not that the attorney general is not going to defend us. I, I have a little problem with the punitive part of it. I don't think it's appropriate for us to uh, ask that. All we really want is our fees to be paid, and that that gives me some concern. And uh, uh, you know, I would ask you to amend that to remove that punitive your motion to remove that punitive part. Laura. Thank you for saying what I was sitting here saying. Um, I don't we can certainly ask for anything, but I really don't think one governmental agency can ask for punitive damages against another one because we did not like how they performed their duty. So uh, where I think we have absolute right to try and recover our legal fees to assess a punitive damage, I think is overreaching our. Mr. Chair, uh, I'll make an amendment to my motion. I already motion. have one amendment here. I'm going to need some advice here that's on the floor. Uh, it's, not, it's, my, it's my motion. Keep going. Okay. Amend as many times as you why, why don't I do this, Mr. <laughs> Chairman? Why don't I make a motion to support your letter and to ask the General Assembly to tax the Attorney General's office as appropriate for 100% of the cost of litigation in keeping with your request from the AG? I second and I second. I assume that's in the event the Attorney General does uh, not. Yeah. I assume that's in the event the Attorney yes. General does not respond affirmatively to my letter. In the, in the event that the Attorney the General does not respond to your letter and pay the costs for the litigation in this matter, that the General Assembly assess his office 100% of the cost of our litigation. I don't think he does. But I don't think he does. But, but regardless, that, that's the motion. Okay. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. We've got a motion on the floor. I He's got a motion from it. Tom. We, we, we need a second. Motion. A second. I was the original second. Okay, for that, that amendment. Okay, now that's where we are. Now, I think David was. Not that I want to create further amendments, um, but uh, uh, would the governor be willing to consider an amendment to his amendment to his amendment to his amendment? that would um, have a triggering mechanism if, if we did not receive a reply from the attorney general within X amount of days, or if we received a reply in the negative that the, the second part of that, uh, th that resolution would become effective. Yes. And we have an amendment to the amendment to the amendment. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, I mean, you need to determine what period of time Governor Goolsby, did you think would be I would request a little bit of guidance from our chairman. 60 days, Mr. Chairman? I think that would be reasonable. <clears throat> I think six. <laughs> I do. Now, can we, can, we, can we state the full amendment now so we know what we're voting on? Ms. Lemon can try. That the Board of Governors supports the letter from Chairman Bissett to the Attorney General, and if Within 60 days, the Attorney General's office does not respond or responds within with a negative that in that event, the Board of Governors will ask the General Assembly to assess the Attorney General's office for legal fees. Mr. Chairman. All legal, all legal fees. I would request one change in that only because in 60 days, the legislature will no longer be in session. I might change the 60 days to 30 days. The 60 days, the legislature is not likely to be in session. So if we wanted to have 
any teeth at all, it might be better to do it while they're still in session. Well, there's still time next year for is them that, to reimburse. Is that appropriate? Yeah. I mean, I, I say I misheard the 60 days for 30 days. <laughs> Mr. Chair, do you have an opinion? Uh, because you, you're right, the General Assembly would be back in session in January. It'd be nice if this were over by then, but I, I don't think it will. They'll be back. Let's just leave it at 60 days. Okay. I need a second. 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 We have a second. Let's call for the question. <clears throat> Thank you, Governor Granger. Okay, all in favor of the motion, indicate by raising your hand. All opposed. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Goolsby, and thank you for those comments. All right, now where was I here? Let's see. Uh, I know I have one more thing. Looking for the next one, but I can't find it. Uh, <laughs> what else have I got here? We're at the end, wherever that is. I've got it. I've got it here. And we're now at. Okay, now, have one more item, and then Henry can go to his new boat. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Okay, as you're, as you're aware, we're holding our first public comment session. It's going to begin in 30 minutes from now. Uh, 110. So I'm looking, 110, the vice chairman says. I'm looking forward to this session, and uh, we'll, we'll be reporting back to the board uh, on what happens at that session. So thank you all very much. There is there is lunch in uh, two, 279 if anybody needs it. Thank you all for a very good, so very good week. A very good week. Good week. Good week. Yeah. Appreciate it. Meeting is adjourned. I apologize. I'm sorry. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNCTV network.